Hello and welcome. Today I want to talk about something that I've gotten a couple of questions about, uh, and that is skill trees. So, in Thrall, uh, the game that I'm working on right now, uh, every character has their own branching skill tree. Uh, every character gets their own action skill, and the skill trees can kind of play into altering how that skill works. Um, that is custom to this game, that's something that I designed. Uh, the skill tree script that I'm using is actually designed uh, by an old RPG Maker community member uh, he, who went by the name of Deity. Uh, he was very active on RMRK, and uh, I don't think he's been active since, but I knew that I wanted to do skill trees in this game. I knew that he had done a skill tree script before for RPG Maker VX, um, but the links were dead, so I actually went on to RMRK, uh, which right now I think is just a read-only site. It's not active anymore. But I found the post where he submitted the script. All the links were dead, but within that post, he actually had his uh, contact info. Uh, so I sent him an email and said, hey, I'm working on a game. Um, you know, here's some samples of my work just to let you know I'm not wasting your time or anything, but I uh, want to use your script. If you have an old copy of it saved somewhere, I would love to get access to that. And he was kind enough to respond and uh, send me a copy of the script. And because of that, I was able to do some fairly heavy modifications and some streamlining of the script. Uh, but uh, this is essentially his original code uh, with my own unique take on it. As for how the actual skills themselves work, uh, that's kind of an interesting little bit of ingenuity myself. Uh, I wrote a script that hides skills. So all of these are actual skills like within the database, um, but they don't actually serve any function as a skill, like a usable skill. And they have a note in their note box that hides them from the menu uh, and the list of skills uh, when you're selecting one in combat. So I'll kind of enter into a practice session to show you what I mean. Uh, I guess nobody has any skills unlocked right now, but if I was to go into the skill menu, the only skills that are going to be listed are ones that are actually usable. And even if you unlock passive skills, they will not show up in here, although they are within that character's, um, I guess, list of learned skills. And then what I did was I, within various different scripts, checked to see if the character had a skill learned, and if they did, then it would alter the functionality of either their action skill or it would give them different buffs based on their equipment. Um, and so that's how I was able to implement passive skills within this game. Uh, so just as an example, uh, Lionel, his action skill is Aura. It grants 2% HP regen for 15 turns. Well, what I did was I went into the script that actually has HP regen as a passive thing at the end of every turn, uh, which is sort of like a, a negative slip damage script. Uh, and then what I did was I checked to see if he, because uh, his next skill down is potency, which increases the HP regen of aura to 3% as opposed to the base 2%. And what I did was I checked to see if this skill here with this ID has been taught to Lionel, and if it is, then it sets the HP regen to 3%, and if not, then it does the base 2%. Uh, and then there's other things, like, you know what, if he's got this skill learned, his evasion stat within the game actor script will actually increase by 10% while aura, while the aura state is active on him. Uh, so that's kind of how I was able to implement passive skills. But I didn't necessarily want to talk about what the skills that themselves are, uh, as much as the design of skill trees and how I came up with uh, concepts for different uh, skills. So what I did with this game is that I wanted to make sure that every character had uh, their own custom skill trees that would kind of define their class, but I wanted every character to only have one usable skill. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but the way this game works is that no character has MP. If you look at their stats right now, you see there's an HP bar and an XP bar for their level. There's no MP bar. And the reason for that is because skills do not cost MP in this game. Instead, they will have a cooldown. So if I unlock Lionel's Aura skill, uh, 
And I've just kind of done a debug thing to get everybody to max level so that I have enough skill points to unlock whatever I need for this video. Um, but if I unlock Lionel's aura skill, and I'll do a practice session with just Lionel. If Lionel uses aura, he gains a bit of a visual effect where he gains a slight transparency and a bit of a white tone to him. And that skill will then go on cooldown. Now it's not showing here because the skill is still active. It will not actually go on cooldown until the skill wears off. So I'm just going to burn a couple turns. Turns go by very, very quickly when facing these enemies because they technically are taking actions, even if it doesn't show it. Uh, but once aura wears off, you'll get to see exactly what I'm talking about here. Now, if you're wondering what that bar in the middle is, I will get to that in just a second here. So aura will last for 15 turns. He'll restore 10 uh, sorry, 2% of his max HP every turn as long as it's active. Uh, and that is just the base skill. That's all it does when you first unlock it. Uh, and it's the only skill he'll actually get throughout the game. Okay, Aura is now worn off, so if I go to the skill list, you'll see Aura in this list, and with this little 20 next to it, indicating how many turns are left before it can be used again. So if I spend a turn and I attack, that is now at 19. And that counts down every turn, and then once it uh, cools down, the cursor above Lionel's head will change to indicate that he's ready to use a skill again, and he can use it again. No MP required. Now the other skills that are listed here, that's what this center bar is for. So this center bar is the overdrive gauge. Overdrive will fill as characters take action or damage. And when that gauge fills, the character has additional skills that they can use once. Uh, they have one character specific skill that is unique to that class. And then they have a weapon based skill that is based on their equipped weapon. So when you use a skill like that, that overdrive gauge will fully deplete, and those skills are removed from the menu. Those are not action skills, those are just overdrive skills, and the reason uh, I make that distinction is because action skills take a certain number of turns to cool down. Overdrive skills can be used repeatedly as long as you can fill your overdrive gauge fast enough. So Lionel should be, there we go, his gauge is full now. And even though Aura is still on cooldown, you can use your overdrives again. Uh, they're kind of like super moves, but they can actually oftentimes be used more frequently than the action skills. Now, there are ways to adjust that. Like, I don't think I've got anything. Do I have something? Let's find out. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything right now on my uh, equipped armors that gives bonus cooldown. But there are armor pieces that can have bonus cooldown, which will reduce the cooldown of those action skills by three turns at the time of the activation. Uh, so that's basically what the action skill is. Every character only gets one. There's no other action skill that they unlock. The, on the only other skills they can use are those overdrive skills. Now, what I wanted to do with the developing of these skill trees is I wanted to expand on the one skill that each character gets instead of providing them a plethora of other skills that either, one, make their initial skills obsolete and therefore not really necessary to have in the first place, or two, um, do the same thing, roughly. Uh, I, I wanted to, to minimize the number of skills that a character gets, but maximize the usefulness of those individual skills. So for example, Lionel's skill grants him HP regen. That's it, not really anything else. It's not super useful, but it is fairly useful. Um, at, at, at a level three, you know, for, for a level one skill, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not overpowered by any means. However, due to the nature of the skill trees and passive skills, I can modify it so I can increase the amount of HP regen he gets. I can grant him bonus accuracy while Aura is active or bonus evasion. Um, I can decrease or increase the cooldown speed while he's at full HP. Uh, this skill here, every mid tier skill has some sort of modifier that will change the entire way that the skill functions. So with this skill here, not only does he get the HP regen and the accuracy and the evasion, but he'll also instantly heal one third of his max HP. 
Uh, and then as you go further down, you, know, you can get bonus thorns damage. You can have it remove all active statuses. So if he's inflicted with burn or freeze or anything like that, he can use aura and then immediately restore all status. Uh, and then, you know, a couple other things that uh, can modify that. And then at the very bottom is capstone allows him to use it on a chosen ally. So I'll kind of show you how that works. And the thing about this is that it's not actually um, replacing the skill. It's it's the exact same skill. He's not changing what skill he is using, but the skill he is using is changing. So if I use Aura, I cannot change which party member I can target. It's only on Lionel. I've unlocked Restore though, so if I use it, I'll instantly heal 1200 HP. That's one third of Lionel's current HP. So the skill itself has not um, changed its ID. I'm not using a different skill, but the skill itself has actually changed its functionality. And then as I go further down and I unlock Blessing, with that same skill, Lionel can now use it on any ally. And the interesting thing about that is that how Aura specifically works is that the ally will actually get the bonuses as well. So if Aura is active, that ally will get the bonus accuracy or the bonus evasion. Uh, that ally will get the bonus thorns damage. If the ally has a status, you can remove that the um, status from that ally. And what's also interesting about that is I was able to, able to make it so that it doesn't just check to see if Aura is active on Lionel before it goes on cooldown, but it actually checks to see if the uh, if Aura is active on any ally before it goes on cooldown. So with that, although every character only gets a single skill that they can use for the entire game, the functionality of those skills can be drastically changed and improved upon, making them more and more useful as you progress through the game. Uh, I, I feel like this was a better solution than giving them you know, a whole new skill every time you unlock something. Uh, it, for one, it prevents old skills from becoming obsolete, and for another, it uh, it, it sort of simplifies combat, uh, because now, although Lionel, with this build, is technically somewhat of a healer, he can't just spam it all the time. He, he can only use it once, and then it goes on cooldown, which means that for the rest of that fight, or at least until it becomes cooled down again, he is free to actually fight. He's not just a dedicated healer. And same with the other party members. Once their skills go on cooldown, they basically can just fight. And they can do things like use items as well. They can use their overdrives. They, it's not just that, oh, you use this skill and then all you can do is attack for the next 20 turns. Like, there is more that they can do. But that's how I wanted to approach the actual usable skills that a character can use. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's some really cool things you can do with this. Like Rage, it puts Brutus into an auto battle state where he only attacks and you you have no control of it. He randomly selects targets and he always attacks. But as you unlock more skills, you know, timing of when you use the skill is important. So if he's at less than a third of his health, it'll fully heal him. That makes rage something you don't necessarily want to trigger right away. If you're maybe at half health, you maybe want to take a couple hits and then trigger rage to get that extra effect. Um, and then, you know, at the bottom of this tree, he loses that auto battle feature where now you can actually control every one of his actions. You can choose which target he, he goes after. You can use overdrive abilities while he's raging. Um, you can do things like defend instead of attack, which actually is useful for him because he's got skills like take aim, where if he uses defend, the next attack gets perfect accuracy, which is again more useful for things like fury, where every time he hits an enemy, he'll gain bonus damage, but he'll lose a bit of accuracy. And once he misses, that's that's all reset. But if he can get perfect accuracy, he'll never miss. Just as an example of kind of some of the synergies that you can do with that. Uh, so that makes retention, or sorry, composure much more useful. Um, and then for Damien, Damien's skills are phenomenal as, as well. His main skill conceals him from attacks, um, making it so that he can't be targeted. Uh, but then later on, he you know stacks overkill damage when he uh, kills an enemy. Uh, with that state active, and then later on, if he kills an enemy, that state doesn't actually remove at all, so he can just stay in that mode, preventing himself from being targeted, while still gaining that damage buff, stacking that overkill, and making him somewhat of a tank, but not really. More, of, well, he's he's a rogue. He's a stealth-based character, uh, which was 
I'm not going to lie, a little bit tricky to kind of figure out how to make a stealth-based character in a turn-based RPG. But I'm glad I found a way that actually kind of works. But anyway, yeah, that's that's basically the theory and the concept behind only having one usable skill, but modifying the functionality of that skill. Now, is that the only thing that the skill trees do, though? No. Uh, the skill trees actually have three separate branches for each character, and there is a reason for that. Uh, I talked about this, I think, in the Let's Play that I did, but it, I just kind of glossed over it. I didn't really go into detail about it. Every character has three separate skill trees, and each skill tree has a separate focus. So the left tree for every character focuses on some sort of a weapon proficiency. For Lionel, he gets proficiency with both swords and blunt weapons, such as maces or staves. Uh, for Brutus, he gets proficiency with axes. And then for Damien, he gets proficiency with uh, knives and daggers. Uh, Mel is the other character. I don't have her active on this file, but she has uh, proficiency with elemental weapons, which means any, any weapon at all could be an axe, a spear, a knife, doesn't matter. If it has an element, she'll get proficiency with that. And while it's not necessary to use that character's specific weapon, if you do, they'll get additional bonuses. Damien is probably the one that has... Damien and Lionel, I would say, are the ones that have the most, uh, I guess, strictness around what weapons they can use. Because if Damien is using knives, then he has three skills that benefit from that. There's Knife Man, where he gets bonus damage. There's Poison Blade, where they all apply weak status on hit. And then there's Deep Venom, where if he gets a critical hit with a knife, it always will apply the weak status. Those three skills become useless if you use a different weapon. Uh, that's not to say you can't, though. If you find a really good spear or something that uh, can get the benefits of all these other skills, uh, then, you know, it might be the better choice. Uh, so you're not locked into that, but it, it does influence what weapon you're going to prefer to use with Damien. Same with Lionel, he gets the entire, like the left, two, two left skills are with swords, the two right skills are with blunt weapons, and then further down there's another skill with swords, another skill with blunt weapons. Uh, Lionel's actually kind of interesting though, because he has a, an ability in his mid, middle of the tree called dual wield, where he can swap weapons in battle using the item command. I'll actually demonstrate that, because it's actually a pretty cool um, pretty cool skill. I'm going to need to get a weapon for this. So let's talk to Davenport. Let's just buy something cheap. Yeah, uh, yeah let's just buy that. doesn't really matter. So with Lionel, he, right now he's got this sword. He could use this instead. Uh, I'm going to keep that uh, current weapon equipped to him. And what I will do, did I unlock the skill? I don't think I did. No, I didn't. Okay, so he's going to get bonus damage with swords, bonus crit damage with swords, and then dual wield where he can swip, swap weapons in combat. And the reason why he has... Actually, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Because Damien has a club equipped. I'm going to give him that sword. And now there's a club here. So the reason why Lionel gets proficiency with two weapons, even though you can only have one equipped at a time, is because he can swap them. So he's got bonus dex with blunt weapons and knockback, as well as bonus damage and crit chance with swords. But, although his base attack is with the sword, if I go to the item menu, I can actually select that weapon, which automatically equips it, and now he can use that club, which gives him the bonus for the element that that weapon has. He can now apply weak status, as you can see with that little skull, briefly. And if he switches back to his sword, he gets his ice element. So with that, by switching weapons, he can alter what buffs he gets from his weapon proficiencies. And later on in the tree, he gets bonuses for swipping weapons in battle. It, switching, switching, swapping, swap, swipping. <laughs> swapping weapons in battle. You know, he'll get bonus dexterity, bonus accuracy, and at the bottom, he'll actually gain a bonus 50% damage for the next 15 turns if he swaps weapons specifically in battle. In the menu won't work, but within battle, boom. Now he's got those three skills triggered. He's got his bonus accuracy, dex, and damage. Switching back, he can keep those bonuses. So that's kind of what uh, 
Lionel's weapon proficiencies are. Again, I'm kind of going into the details of each individual character's skill trees. That's not my intent with this, uh, but more to go over the structure of how the skill trees are organized. Uh, but I want to give some examples, just kind of uh, detail that. So with Lionel, uh, or any character, sorry, uh, the tree on the far left usually has to do with some sort of weapon proficiency. Lionel is definitely the one that has the most um, focus on his weapons. Uh, Brutus actually gets uh, focus on Fury, which is a stackable skill that gives him buffs over time. And then Damien, uh, his main focus is actually on weak status, which daggers are preferred to that, but it's more focused on the status as opposed to the weapon itself. Um, so that's the left tree. It's very much a weapon proficiency focused tree, uh, but not necessarily exclusively. Whereas the center tree focuses much more heavily on the action skills, as I kind of showcased earlier with uh, Lionel's aura tree. Uh, so these, these center trees focus on how do we modify the starting skill to make it as useful as possible. And then the right tree actually focuses on a passive ability that is character specific. So for Brutus, he'll gain buffs while he's inflicted with burn status, which is not very useful in the beginning of the game. But as he gets further down the tree, he finds ways to give himself burn status. He removes some of the penalties of being inflicted with burn status. And then further down, he gets really good skills where he's immune to being frozen, he has a 5% chance to just ignore all damage, and he even gives his weapon fire element all the time as long as he's himself on fire. And so Brutus actually gains buffs for when he's inflicted with the status. Mel is kind of the reverse. She gains buffs for resisting statuses, and so she'll gain uh, bonuses to her resistance and her elemental resistance. Uh, Damien, he has a focus on critical hits and critical hit damage. Uh, and then Lionel actually gets buffs to his max HP and his HP regen, uh, which even at the bottom of that skill, uh, he can share half of his HP regen with all his allies. Uh, so with that, uh, each character has their own kind of unique trait that their far right skill tree will focus on. So each tree has their own individual focus, but across the characters, they do have a similar theme. The left tree is focused on a weapon, the center tree is focused on their action skill, the right tree is focused on a passive trait unique to that character. Uh, now, one of the things that went into the design of these trees, uh, finding that theming was very helpful with actually determining what skills I wanted to put into what tree and, and even how to design certain skills. Uh, you know, it's, if, if I thought, okay, I want the right tree to be focused on Damien's critical hits. Okay, well, what can I do with that? Well, I can increase his critical hit chance. I can increase his critical hit damage. I can make it so that when he scores a critical hit, it reduces his cooldown. I can I can have a kill skill where if he kills an enemy, he gains really, really high critical hit damage for a brief period of time. Um, you know, I can make it so that when he has his action skill active, he gets bonus crit chance. Things like that. You know, there's there's skills that I, I all I need to do is think, okay, what can I do that's related to critical hits? And then come up with skills that give those bonuses. Uh, and, and, you know, every tree has uh, 10 skills, so it's not terribly difficult to come up with that many, but uh, there were times where I had to stretch a little bit. But one of the other things that's uh, crucial to this is making sure that the trees synergize. Uh, so for example, with Damien here, uh, these two skills here are only useful when his action skill is active. Well, that's going to be extremely effective when you get to the bottom of this tree, which keeps his action skill active for much, much longer. Uh, same with his overkill skill that applies overkill damage to the next hit when he kills an enemy with stalking active. That synergizes with killer which increases his critical hit damage by 100%. Well, overkill damage is not multiplied when you score a critical hit unless killer is active. If killer is active, that overkill damage will double. Uh, but that's the only way that it will double. So these skills synergize very well together. And then when you factor in things like, you know, his proficiencies with knives, it creates a, a kind of an all-encompassing picture that makes these skills and these trees synergize together very well. Uh, same with, you know, Lionel's, uh, his, uh, the bottom of his paladin tree, he shares his HP regen with all his allies, or at least half of it. Well, with that, he could use Aura on an ally to give that ally direct healing and that one ally a considerable amount of HP regen. 
Or he could use it on himself, and because he gets bonus HP regen, because he shares half his HP regen, now using Aura on himself will share half of that with all of his allies. So finding synergies between the trees was actually very important when it came to the design of these skills. So yeah, when it comes to uh, you know designing the action skills, that just started very simple. I wanted something that was healing, but not necessarily... Uh, a, a direct restoring skill, but I figured I could maybe introduce that later. Um, you know, I wanted something that just gave a massive buff to stats. I wanted something that had maybe a, a bit of a damage nullification or like a, a stealth-based ability. And then Mel just has three action skills that are basically just spells. They're just attacks. They're alternate elemental attacks. And they're, the skills that she gets with that are kind of pretty cool as well. So... Yeah, uh, the action skills were... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to focus this video onto three kind of talking points. One of them being the action skills and how uh, every character only gets one usable skill. The other being the actual structure of the skill trees and the individual, individual branches and what theme each one of them follows, as well as the synergies between them, which is very important. Uh, but the uh, one last thing that I want to talk about with this video uh, is something that's very important when it comes to designing skill trees like this, is, which is that you need to have some way to be able to uh, unspec and respec your characters. So, for example, if I give uh, Lionel all these points into these trees, well, as you can see down in the corner here, each skill costs a certain amount, and that cost increases the further down the tree you go. Uh, the way that I have this structured is that by the time you hit level 99, you can unlock all of these skills. But let's say you're only level 7, and you've got 7 skill points. Well, that means you could... this Action skills are free, but you can spend 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 skill points to get to the bottom or to the middle of a tree. But the next skill is 4 points, and I hit level 7, I've got that 1 point. I want to use it right away, so I'm going to say put a point into Swordsman and get the bonus damage with Swords. Well, what happens when I hit level 8, 9, 10, and I actually do have enough points to get to the next point in this tree? Well, if I'm spending all those skill points in other trees, if I don't have a way to take them out, it's going to be a long time before I can get there. So for that, it's important to have some sort of way to respec your characters. And this here is a character that's going to be showing up within the first five dungeons. I'm not going to say which dungeon and the setting in which you re recruit her. Uh, but uh, this is a character, she's available in the demo. Uh, if you beat the Bloodstone Mine two times, you unlock all the recruitable characters uh, with the exception of one, and she is one of them. And if you talk to her, she'll offer a respec uh, for, uh, I believe it's 5% or 7% of your total gold, and that includes any gold that you have in storage. If you accept, you can choose who to respec, so I'm going to respec Lionel. Brief little animation plays, you pay a certain amount of gold. And now Lionel's skills have been completely reset. He's got all his skill points back, and I can reset the skills in whatever way I want. This is important. If you don't have some way of respecing your characters, it can be very, very frustrating for someone who maybe doesn't necessarily understand how the system works, and so they spread their points out and they unlock all the tier 1 skills, and by level 6 they haven't even come close to unlocking a mid-tier skill. Um, but if you do have an ability, uh, a way to respec, you can spend those points, make use of them right away, and not have to go four or five levels without unlocking another skill if, in between dungeons, you can go and respec your characters. Uh, it's also important to have that early on in the game. Uh, I introduced this character within... Like I said, within the first five dungeons, uh, you could unlock her by the end of the second one, uh, or it could be by the end of the fifth. Uh, you complete the first dungeon, then you gain access to three more right away, and you can complete them in any order. So whichever dungeon you choose to complete uh, will unlock her. Uh, so you can put that off and say, you know what, I don't need to respec right away. Um, I'll save that for the fourth dungeon. Or you could say, you know what, I want to be able to do that right now. I'm not worried about things like an item shop or capacity increases. I just want to be able to respec, and you can get her right away. Uh, and it's important for games to do that. When you think about games like the Borderlands series, you can respec uh, anywhere where there's a new U station, um, which they're like all over the place. They're right at the start of the game. Um, and it, the same kind of thing. It costs you just a percentage of your gold. Uh, that encourages experimentation. 
that encourages players to say, you know what, I want to try this. I don't know how it's how effective it's going to be right away. It might not be that useful and I might want to save it for later, but I'm going to give it a shot because I, th I think it could be useful. Let's say, for example, that I have uh, Lionel specced into his sword skills and then I go five levels without finding a good enough sword to replace the one that he's currently using and it just makes more sense for him to use a different weapon. It just does more damage. It's, it's a better weapon even with his buffs. Well, now I've got all these skills spent into swords and he's not using a sword because it just isn't the most viable option at that time. If there's no option to respec, now this character is stuck using useless skills uh, when they could be specced into something that would be more useful. So having that as an option in the game and having it early encourages experimentation. It gives players the option to try new things and they, there's, no, there's not as much fear around spending a skill. You know, when you when you unlock a skill, you can be like, okay, I can spend this right away, and I know I'm not going to be stuck with it for hours and hours and hours. Um, or you could even have a system like Diablo. Uh, I know Diablo 3 does this. Uh, the earlier ones I don't think as much, where if you just select the skill, it could unspec it right away, and you can spend that point right away at any point, any time. That can be a little bit too overwhelming sometimes. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a set point where you can respec so that uh, you're not constantly switching between skills and it gives you a chance to fully experience th uh, those added abilities before you switch them out. Um, but that is an effective method as well, especially for uh, something that's more of like a power gaming thing where you're trying to uh, maximize different builds and you, you kind of need to adjust on the fly and in the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's essentially all I wanted to discuss with this video was just, you know, certain decision making around why uh, there's only one usable skill per character, why the, the trees are structured the way they are and how, how to develop those trees. Um, and then, yeah, the importance of having a, a respec option. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do a bit more of a hardcore gameplay experience, you could have it so that you can't respec at all. Um, but if a character is unfamiliar with how your game works or how those skills work, and there's not a plethora of resources online, like videos of Let's Players trying different builds, that's just going to be really, really frustrating. So it's, it's important to have some sort of ability to do that. Uh, and honestly, the only way that I did that with uh, this character here is that it just removes all the skills from uh, someone's learned library of skills and then reallocates all skill points based on that character's level. It's entirely evented. It's not even scripted. Um, so yeah, that's that's essentially it. Uh, I feel like there was something else I wanted to mention, and it's not coming to me right away, so it must not be very important. Um, if there's something that I did forget to mention that you want to know about, uh, feel free to leave a comment below, and I will do my best to respond as soon as possible. Um, but with that, I just wanted to put out a video discussing skill trees and how they work, at least within the context of this game. Um, your game will probably be very different, and that's totally fine. Uh, this is my game. So anyway, with that, just wanted to put this out there for you. Hope it helps somebody. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.